Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming back to Major Virtues of Objectivism. Uh, our today's lecture is the objectivist virtue of productiveness. And the theme of productiveness is that productive work is a central value in a rational life. And this is a distinctive view, really, of objectivism. I mean, it's not like other ethics don't value work, but they don't link work to the moral ideal the way objectivism does. For objectivism, your career of work is the moment of greatest heroism, the greatest achievement, and one of the most very important things you'll do in your whole life. And it's absolutely central as a value. I don't think there's really, uh, I don't think there's really any better way to understand the root of the difference between objectivism and traditional ethics on this issue than to highlight the way objectivism looks at charity. Yes, charity. Now, by charity, I simply mean the giving of time, uh, money, and effort to the support of others unrelated to oneself. That, in addition, is given with no direct hope of a return of value. At best, a, a charity is a very long-term investment in a project one values. Like, say, one knows a person of potential, and one gives them support so they can achieve their potential, and one hopes maybe Someday something wonderful will happen out of that. Um, and that's a kind of investment, but uh, there's really no link to any direct return or even much concrete respect, too much concrete expectation that there will be a personal return to that. And at worst, uh, charity can be an exercise in outright sacrifice of one's values done for the sake of God or virtue or other people. Now, modern culture is a secular culture. And in America, our industrial society and its religious toleration have made the common public culture one that's tied to personal enjoyment and material goods. And we can see this in the secularization of Christmas, for example, where Santa Claus is a kind of pagan god who represents material abundance. You know, that's, and Christmas itself becomes a celebration of material culture and material abundance and all the things we could buy. Incidentally, to give, but mostly that we can buy. But in this secular context, charity has become a crucial moral focus. For all ethical systems that deny the importance of material needs, the ethics that deprecate the ultimate value of happiness here on Earth, charity becomes an important test of a person's commitment to his morality. In the traditional view, then, Work as such is amoral. It's a personal choice. The purpose of work is to fulfill responsibilities, to not be a drain on society or one's family, to support one's family, community, and workplace, or country. CEOs of corporations have stakeholders they have to support. John Rawls, the most famous social philosopher of the last 50 years, argued in this vein and as long as our social arrangements benefited the worst off and the least able, this is the, the maximin principle, uh, as long as their social arrangements benefited the worst off and the least able as much as possible, then differences in wealth and work were permitted. Permissible as long as they benefit the worst off. It's not wrong to make money in this view, but what is noble is your service to others. Giving your wealth away to charity, as Bill Gates is now doing, is what really deserves moral praise. The objectivist view is completely the reverse. What is noble and good is for you to live and be happy. Other people matter, but basically they are ends in themselves, responsible for themselves. Working, creating value, and achieving, that's the theme of successful living. As to charity, there's nothing wrong with it. You might say it's amoral. There's nothing wrong with charity as long as it fits into your scheme of values and it doesn't come at a sacrifice of more important values. Charity is rather like a luxury purchase in this view. Uh, you know, if someone buys a Lexus instead of a Toyota, people normally take that as a personal choice. It's not reprehensible. It's not uh, laudatory. And in objectivism, if someone gives to support the ballet, or the other takes a beach vacation, well, those are both personal spending choices. 
And as long as they fit in each person's budget, preferences, and life goals, they're fine. Productive achievement is man's noblest activity, as Ayn Rand said. It's creating the values that make your life, and in fact, all life, possible. Creating those values is the focus of the virtue of productiveness. Here's how Ayn Rand described productiveness in John Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged. She said, productiveness is your acceptance of morality, your recognition of the fact that you choose to live, that productive work is the process by which man's consciousness controls his existence, a constant process of acquiring knowledge and shaping matter to fit one's purpose, of translating an idea into physical form, of remaking the earth in the image of one's values that all work is creative work if done by a thinking mind, and no work is creative if done by a blank who repeats in uncritical stupor a routine he has learned from others. That your work is yours to choose, and the choice is as wide as your mind. That nothing more is possible to you, and nothing less is human. That your work is the process of achieving your values, and to lose your ambition for values is to lose your ambition to live. Now, I'm going to be covering all the themes of this summary during this lecture. And if I fail to cover one of them, please ask me a question afterwards. But the overall virtue, then, that we'll be discuss discussing, productiveness, is the commitment to taking responsibility for achieving one's values through the productive use of one's mind and body. Now, in this section of the talk, in this section of the talk, I want to uh, discuss first productive work and uh, the role of work in human life and the objectivist view of work, and then turn to the, uh, the virtue elements of productiveness uh, more generally. So, in discussing productive work, I want to discuss what makes it the central value of life. Why is pursuing a career of productive work at the essence of what it means to be virtuous? And once we've discussed the full meaning of productive work, we can turn to fleshing out more fully the idea of productiveness as a virtue that applies to many aspects of life, including but not limited to one's career. And I'm going to close with a consideration of what responsibility amounts to in light of all this. Now, as I said, the core meaning of the virtue of productiveness is the policy of acquiring material values by productive work. We need to identify and embrace this principle because productive work is a course we choose in life. It's possible to evade it and seek an easier way of gaining wealth. Productiveness is tied to the idea that one can live by production, and production is the creation of value. Basically, it means creating all the values one needs, such as food, clothing, housing, medicine, and so on. Fortunately, in a division of labor society, we don't have to literally produce every individual product we use. We're able to trade the money we earn from our productive work for goods that others produce. It's a marvelous system, really, that allows all of us to specialize in our fields of work, uh, yet benefit from all the specialization that other people do. The key to this system is trade, Formally speaking, trade is a voluntary exchange conducted to mutual benefit. When people trade, they both agree to the exchange, and after it is over, both people, if they went into it with the right state of mind, are better off. Production is really just one mode of, mode of gaining values. If you live alone in nature, then you have a basic choice. Live by production, or live by hunting and gathering. And I'd say, given the productive technology we now know of, production is your best bet. You know, you think of Robinson Crusoe, for instance. Well, what are his choices when he's shipwrecked, and he can gather whatever coconuts there are on his island, and then from then on, it's whatever, whatever he can produce using the best uh, 18th century technology that he has uh, at his disposal. But in fact, we don't live like Robinson Crusoe alone in nature. We live in society, surrounded by people. And when one lives in society, it's possible to live as a parasite on the wealth and production of others. So one form of parasitism is mooching, which is dependence on the voluntary sacrifices of others. The strategy of mooching was represented in Atlas Shrugged by Philip Reardon, who lived by sponging off of his brother Hank, 
the successful industrialist. To make this work, you usually need some moral argument to convince the other person to support you. And in Philip's case, he traded on the morality of altruism, arguing that Hank had a duty to support his brother and that Philip's humanitarian projects were worthy of Hank's support on moral grounds. But as the plot of Atlas shows, this isn't always very reliable. And basically the problem is that if the mark gets wise, you can be given the boot summarily. But if you want to be a parasite, you have another more direct option. This is what Ayn Rand called looting, predation on others and their goods by force. This is the policy of the thief, the mugger, the robber, and the dictator. Now I'm gonna argue that production is definitely the better way of getting values, but don't take my word for it. Let me demonstrate. Well, production is the means by which human beings maintain their survival by creating food, shelter, and medicine, by creating knowledge and technologies that raise the standard of living, by creating artworks, counseling techniques, philosophies, and other vital spiritual goods. Now, what would life be like without production? Well, for one thing, there would be much less of it, namely life. There's no more basic measure of human life than the quantity of human lives and their longevity. And one uh, excellent way to measure that is to look at the population changes in the world. Until about 10,000 years ago, humans lived as hunter-gatherers because the land could only support about one person per square kilometer or about 2.5 people per square mile. People had to stay spread out. Even a village-sized community was hard to sustain. Murderous conflict between different families or even isolated individuals was endemic because people were in direct conflict for limited resources. The power of production is evident in the increase of world population since that time. Perhaps 10 million hunter-gatherers lived 10,000 years ago. Around 1 billion people lived around the, the year 1750, on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. And today, there are more than 5 billion. This rise in population has been accompanied by a rise in life expectancy at birth, from little more than 20 years in the era before agriculture to more than 70 years and still rising today in the industrialized world. Back before production was widely or deeply used, during the Ice Age, for example, people were mostly hunter-gatherers. Population growth up until the agricultural revolution around 10,000 BC was 15,000 15 thousandths of 1% per year. That's 0.0015% per year. When you are a hunter-gatherer, your population cannot exceed the crude carrying capacity of your environment. There are only so many birds in the forest or berries on the vine. But the application of reason to production in agriculture raised annual population growth rates to a whopping average of one-tenth of 1% 1 per year. Then in the 1700s, it rose to three-tenths of 1% per year. In the 1800s, with the spread of industry and the growth of scientific medicine, it rose to six-tenths of a percent per year. And finally, in the 1900s, the population took off, rising 2% per year on average. So the causal sequence is this. Production creates wealth, which raises standard of living and the carrying capacity of resources, which increases longevity and population. These, in, in turn, are sure signs that production supports human life. So why would anyone want to be a moocher or a looter? Well, I mean, because they can. But as we'll see, these aren't really very useful ways of getting values. Mooching and looting are both offenses against the principle of trade. Mooching, after all, denies that both parties should benefit from a trade. Because trade is voluntary exchange to mutual benefit. When you mooch, uh, the interaction is voluntary. The person who's giving to you doesn't have to do it. But it, the exchange isn't one where both parties benefit. Mooching asks one party, in effect, to be a sacrificial cow. So the victim doesn't have any real reason to support the moocher. In trade, by contrast, each party has good reasons to exchange because each stands to benefit. The looter, on the other hand, doesn't care what the other party wants. 
The looter takes what he wants at the point of the sword or the knife or the gun. But the trouble with looting is that it gives the victim every reason to resist. This is why most criminals end up dead or in jail or impoverished, and why most wannabe dictators end up dead, and those that survive live in fear of revolt every moment of their lives. In addition, using threats against people does nothing to make them think and create. In fact, it's contrary to all thinking, because it substitutes your threat for reality in the victim's mind, and your commands for the victim's judgment. But without the judgment about reality, commitment, uh, uh, I'm sorry, without judgment about reality, creativity and productivity are greatly impeded. And that's why the communist countries, for example, fell far behind the capitalist ones. Because in the communist countries, people weren't left free to produce, they were told what to produce at the point of a gun, and where to work, and where to live at the point of a gun. And this is why no Islamic theocratic regime is a threat to outproduce the West. Similarly, because they're ordering people uh, what to do, instead of, uh, uh, with the threat of uh, violent force, they're eliminating the very source of uh, wealth and uh, achievement. Now, by contrast to these two parasitical ways of getting wealth, living by production and trade is a secure, reliable, safe, and efficient way of gaining values. By producing values for trade, you give billions of people a reason to possibly trade with you, either directly or, as is more likely, indirectly through the global, global commercial network. Does anyone here have an iPhone? Right, so your iPhone, uh, the people that made the iPhone, I think you'd agree, had a reason to value you. You paid them for the iPhone. But it wasn't just the distributed workers of Apple who are around the US and probably internationally. There are factories in China where it's assembled. There are designers, God knows where they all are, who are involved. There's, there's suppliers to all these companies. And the suppliers, and there's the customers of all the employees, all of whom are benefiting from the fact that you bought an iPhone. They're all over the world. And they have very concrete and quantifiable reasons to value you. And in fact, they're working hard to still win your business because they value it so much. Now think about that. You're giving all these people reasons to possibly trade with you, and you in turn have something to offer them that they might want. And they, for their part, put all the variety of their production at your service. I mean, do you want a fancy German car? You work to produce what you need to trade for it, and you have it. Do you need medicine? Work to produce and trade. And thus the commitment to productive work stands against both mooching and looting. And a productive individual deals with others by trade and lives securely and independently that way. Now, I've been talking as if we produce and barter for our product and other products. But in fact, we usually work in a complex organization like a company and receive a money payment for, or a salary for what we do. We then use the money to buy the things we need. The principle of trade is very much at work, of course. We get paid by the choice of our employers or by our customer's choice if we own a company. That's trade, the trade of our labor for the money. And then we use the money to buy other products. And that's trade, too. We're all willing to part with our money in order to buy what we need. In a system of, of production and monetary trade, money is a badge of honor. In trade, the only way to gain money is, is to produce for someone else a product that they value. You earn your living by the money you gain, and the wealth you accumulate is a sign of the esteem in which others hold your productive efforts. Well, here's a symbol of esteem right there. The ability, when I give someone this symbol of esteem, I'm telling them how much I approve of what they're doing and how much I would like to benefit from it. Consider the successful uh, investor Warren Buffett. Through decades of canny investing, building companies, and providing them with funding when others were fleeing in panic, he's made his investors and workers wealthy and has become one of the richest people in the world. In fact, Buffett has more wealth than many small countries. In the objectivist view, considering that his money comes from trade, his great wealth is a great badge of honor. And whether you have much or little wealth, you should consider every dollar you gain by honest trade as your own badge, badge of honor. It's someone's sign of approval of your efforts, and you've earned it. 
Unfortunately, few in today's culture really understand the meaning of trade. Or they don't understand that a producer really earns his own, his own living. The left wing, for example, agitates for welfare rights, a right to health care that someone else will produce, a right to child care that someone else will produce, a right to food that someone else will produce. This whole attitude derives a root from the attitude of egalitarianism. Egalitarian ideals pervade our culture. They rest on a conception of social justice, the proper order for society. Egalitarianism says that everyone has a right to the same income and property. But objectivism has the moral and practical rebuttal. We all have equal rights to sign contracts and own property. Egalitarianism says if you get rich in any way, you should at least feel guilty. It's not really just for you to have more, and in the ideal society, everyone would have more or less the same amount. Objectivism says, if you get rich by production and trade, you should be proud of it, because you earned it. Ayn Rand's response to egalitarianism is the idea that in a free society, the people of ability rise to the highest levels. This would be a kind of aristocracy of merit based on the values people produce and the recognition they receive through the voluntary praise of the marketplace. It's worth appreciating this. If someone wins an election, they mostly get voted in by the people who just took a few minutes and an idle thought to support them in the voting booth. I mean, how much time do you spend when you go to vote really considering your decision and weighing its full consequences? And meanwhile, whenever anyone's elected, a some substantial minority of the voters were opposed. They didn't want that person. But if someone is voted rich in the marketplace by the dollars of purchasers like you, then no one who opposes the producer need contribute a single dime. And every dollar the producer earns represents the independent decision of another person to part with the real value with some kind of real value in virtue of the superior value they got from the product or service they bought. So that every ring of a cash register is a note of approval. Ka-ching, you did good by me. Ka-ching, this is worth more to me than, I, than what I paid for it. Ka-ching, here's my way of saying thanks for that great product, or for that cheap product, or for that convenient product. In Alice Shrugged, Ayn Rand compares the idea of a pyramid of ability to the, what she calls the aristocracy of pull. The aristocrats of pull get their way by backroom deals and extortion. They use government power to force people to give them products and services. They use intimidation and force to crush competitors. They serve as parasites on the productive efforts of others. There isn't really any choice in society that allows no people to have influence over social institutions. That's not possible. People would have to not be interacting to let no people influence social institutions. But in a market society, the most able, the most productive, and the most willing run the show through the institutions they create, which are always adapting, and which, again, only exist because people that directly care about what they do support them. Their status ultimately depends on their ability to provide value to others. Thus, the pyramid. Those who provide the greatest values, including skill, technology, capital, etc., are at the top. Those who contribute the least and benefit the most are at the bottom. And they're only at the bottom in terms of their influence and, uh, and wealth in society. It's not their moral worth at all. I mean, in recognizing the pyramid of ability, we recognize the people who make the greatest productive efforts possible. The inventors and investors and creators who provide companies, technologies, and the physical plant, um, the inspirational artworks, etc., that raise the productivity of even a person of very mo modest knowledge or skill to towering heights. Does the pyramid of ability mean that you're unworthy if you are, say, a lowly janitor? I mean, plainly, if you're a janitor, you aren't a productive titan, at least not in that role, and you're paid accordingly. Your pay is a measure of the values others place on your work. It's not a measure of your moral value. The pyramid concerns the size of a person's contribution to society, 
But the standard of life success for any person derives from that person's needs, capacities, and purposes. So say there's a person of modest abilities who has little education and who does the job well and who likes taking care of the place and has the job then of being a janitor. Then being a janitor is an achievement and a good way to work and part of a good and morally worthy life. But instead, let's imagine that a brilliant young engineer, call him John Galt if you like, is working as a janitor just to mark time. He's wasting his talents and he knows it. But hey, it's part of his plan to foment the revolution. Well, what to make of that? He has his purpose in doing it, but it's a complicated plan. It's a waste of his talents. Let's hope the revolution comes soon. And one more example. There were some state workers in Albany, where I live, who were janitors, who were recently discovered getting drunk and lolling around in a man cave that they had built in a state parking garage. And they weren't even doing really the minimum to hold down what was basically a no-brainer job with fantastically high compensation for that class. Now, these folks are janitors who are unworthy. They're unworthy by the standard of their own potential as human beings. They were unworthy of even being janitors. So here's what Ayn Rand has to say about finding the right level on the pyramid of ability in her inimical, inimical, inimic, in, in her difficult to imitate fashion. <laughs> she, in, yes, inimical. She says, to cheat your way to a job bigger than your mind can handle is to become a fear-corroded ape on borrowed motions and borrowed time. And to settle down into a job that requires less than your mind's full capacity is to cut your motor and sentence, your, sentence yourself to another kind of motion, decay. One wouldn't want to become a fear corroded ape, and one wouldn't be sent, want to be sentenced to decay. For the vast majority of people, productive work is the primary means of supporting their lives. But work isn't just the means you use to get money and values. Instead, while working to support your life, you're flourishing personally and morally. Work calls on a wide range of mental skills. These include mathematical skills like calculating financial results and projections, planning projects and work schedules, inventing new work processes, machines, software, designs, logos, etc. It can involve writing skills and often demands concentration and clear focused attention to results-oriented tasks. Work calls on social skills, including the ability to effectively work with a team of colleagues, um, and it calls on skill in dealing with relative strangers, which is what most customers and co-workers are. I don't think it's so often that work calls on the social skills of intimacy, but still, the workplace can become a place of deeper friendships and romances. In fact, in today's society, workplace interactions are one of the primary social venues for adults. If you're flourishing, you're living up to the standard of the life of man qua man. You're living a life rich in values and characterized by virtue. In fact, work calls on all aspects of your virtues. Let's consider them. Rationality, it's essential to productive endeavor, especially the choice to focus, which is a source of effort and personal initiative. Honesty and moral integrity are guarantors of your reputation with colleagues and clients. One needs benevolence, especially sensitivity and courtesy towards others to develop good relations with coworkers and to build connections with clients. And one needs courage, for entrepreneurial ventures, and confidence along with independent thinking to stand by one's own judgment and make fr a fresh contribution to the workplace. You need justice to determine what your work and that of others is worth and to treat employees fairly if you have any. And you need responsibility to earn your way by performing well. And of course, you need pride to buffer against that nasty side of work society, the gossip, the backbiting, the bad bosses, and, a, and, a, and you need a practice of aspiring to personal improvement, which is part of pride. So does work call on virtues? You bet it does, and in spades. And in addition to all that, for many people, their work is a, main, is a means of changing the world, changing it by creating new products, changing it by building new institutions, and sometimes changing it by changing society. 
So is productive work a means of flourishing? I think it sure is. There's no other activity that can call on such a variety of faculties and virtues while standing as such a central and major source of crucial values. But now, just to check, am I just describing work as it is for Howard Rourke, the entrepreneurial architect hero of the Fountainhead? Well, what about his buddy Mike, the electrician? And what about, by extension, other workers like him? Factory workers, store clerks, customer service call center workers, bank tellers, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers. Well, Mike needs those virtues too. Does Mike the electrician succeed in work by lying on the job or welshing on his work duties? No, he needs honesty, integrity, and responsibility. Does Mike succeed in work by ignoring the quality of co-workers or failing to judge the dependability or truthfulness of his boss? No, he needs justice too. In short, he needs aspects of all those virtues for his work wiring buildings. Does Mike support his life by working? He sure does. And does he change the world? Well, at the least, he puts his stamp on the world, the quality of his work, and the impact it has on the buildings he works on. Even a supermarket clerk has an impact every day on the customers he deals with. Now, I'm not saying all work is a, is a fiesta. No, a lot of it is hard. And I'm not saying that work always calls on all of one's faculties. We need a broader society, re relaxation activities, a variety of contexts, and close personal relationships. These are things we often find outside our workplace. But work is a means of flourishing par excellence. And for most people, it's the pillar of their ability to exist independently and to keep bread on the table. And that makes it a central pursuit in life. Now, given the importance of work, a career takes on a special significance in objectivism. A career is a choice of one's life trajectory in many respects. The, and the preparation for it will expose you to one kind of society, and the context of the profession itself will expose you to another. It will, set the, it will set the kind of tasks you will most be engaged in. And in choosing your career, you also make choices about how much income you plan to make. Of course, many people change careers several times in their lives. I mean, I'm one who did. So nothing is set in stone. And yet there's a real advantage in the focused pursuit of a career. Focused work in a career takes uh, is an advantage because it allows one to accumulate skill and contacts. This makes a career a rising arc of achievement as one becomes more and more proficient. And the trouble with changing careers is that one falls back often into a lower level of proficiency in the new career. And one's preparation for the old career often may not contribute much to the new one. I mean, I went to grad school to start with to do economics. And I'll tell you, I talk about economics in my current job, but I don't do anything an economist would consider real economics. So I had to reboot in order to do the job I currently do. OK, I'm not doing career counselor here. I simply want to emphasize that for objectivism, one's choice of career, however one makes it, has a deep significance, revealing the direction in which someone committed to productive work is going to shape his or her soul. I'd like to close out the discussion of work here just by commenting for a second on a common and important question, which is, what if you don't work? What if you don't work? I mean, not that you, that you move, not that you loop, but what if you just you don't work? There are, two main, uh, there are two main types of people to whom this question applies. The first type are homemakers, full-time parents or domestic partners who've removed themselves from the job market, at least for a time. They haven't really stopped working, though. If they're still working to maintain their home, to prepare meals, to handle daily tasks, uh, and or bear care, care for or educate children, all that is work if done seriously and with the purpose in mind. It's just that it's work done as part of a family partnership where the cash is earned by one partner and the work in the home is done by the other. I mean, if you, if you have a two-income uh, family instead, all that work still has to get done. It just has to get divided up uh, by each of the money-earning uh, members and uh, uh, in a different way. And frankly, it will cut into both of their abilities to, uh, to pursue their careers. The second type of non-workers I'm thinking of are the wealthy and pensioners. 
rich folks and prudent retirees don't need to work to earn their living. Money comes in from their investments or their pensions. They aren't mooching or looting from anyone. Now what objectivism says to them is that they may get value from a variety of productive projects. It isn't healthy to be really idle, and one always needs more values. One needs to stay engaged in the world and to be active in pursuing values one cares about. I don't think it really matters in this case whether one is young or old. A retiree might invest his energy in travel and hobbies. A wealthy person might take on causes and projects, or might be advised to try to leverage his wealth into a productive enterprise. So, to summarize, wealth is a badge of honor if you earned it by trade. The people of ability have nothing to apologize for. They earn their wealth and status if they got it through training. A career or a series of careers in productive work is the central means of living a rich and flourishing life. Now, productive work is the core commitment of productiveness, but there's more to this virtue than simply work. So I'd like to turn now to the full sense of productiveness as a virtue that applies not only in our work, but in the pursuit of values more generally. The temptation that productiveness guards against is the desire to see one's wishes fulfilled without effort. This is essentially the desire to evade causality, to be able to get, away, get something for nothing. We can see this temptation in get-rich-quick schemes and the mentality behind them. These swindles can aim at non-material values as easily as material ones, seeking to get love quick or to get smart quick. But at their root is a wish, wish that someone else will provide one's values. How? Somehow. I don't know. Productiveness, in, a more, in, this, in the general sense I'm talking about right now, is a commitment to taking responsibility for achieving one's values. It's a general commitment to take responsibility for achieving your values. It's a commitment to knowing how and to knowing who will get the job done, namely you. Ayn Rand outlined three cardinal values, reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Productiveness is the virtue associated with purpose, a policy that Ayn Rand called purposefulness in one version of her journals. I'm using the term purposefulness to stand for this broad commitment to take responsibility for achieving one's purposes. It means one must see to it that things get done, that one solves problems, that one has realistic plans for the future, that one actually makes friends, and one seeks out spiritual fuel. Purposefulness, in this sense, is the most general form of the virtue of productiveness. And a purposeful person is engaged with his values and takes responsibility for making his dreams come true. There are three other elements of productiveness that identify specific tendencies to vice and point to good policies for achieving values. The first of these is thrift. In traditional ethics, productiveness has uh, its closest analogs in the virtues of thrift and industry. And these are particularly relevant to productive work and financial management, of course. But they've also been thought to reflect broader tendencies of character. For example, in the bourgeois interpretation of uh, Benjamin Franklin. Thrift and industry can be understood as minor virtues or elements of the objectivist conception of productiveness. Now, thrift itself is the policy of making the most of one's means. Uh, ben Franklin summarized it by saying that it meant waste nothing. Your means include the forms of wealth, but also your time and prospects, your personal resources and talents, and your friends and social connections. These are all means you can use to try and achieve your ends. And thrift is your stand against all tendencies to waste. It's a species of productiveness in the mode of responsibility, because the means to one's end are what one takes responsibility for. If you're thrifty, you know what it costs and how much time it takes to do a project. You know when your money is worth more than your time, and you know when your time is worth more than the money on offer. I think most people, for most people today, the greatest temptation is to be wasteful with their money. Credit cards and the huge range of convenient project products that are for sale in the shopping malls and online tempt us with instant satisfaction while delaying the price we pay. It's easier to enjoy the moment than to take account for the future. And so many people spend more time, and spend more than they really should, and end up in precarious financial circumstances. 
We've seen this, really, in the financial crisis with devastating results. But it's an endemic problem for many, perhaps most Americans, and it's ruin ruining their ability to really live well. We have other means of enjoying our time that don't cost money, and there are many ways of saving money by making or doing things ourselves. Ayn Rand's motto uh, was, take what you want and pay for it. It's purposive to take what you want, but it's thrifty to know what you'll have to pay to get it. The flip side of Rand's motto is that if you can't pay for what you want, the full cost over the long term, then you can't take what you want either. Thrift is the virtue of paying for only what you really want and paying the best price you can. Now, I was saying that I wanted to talk about both thrift and industry. Industry is a policy of consistently exerting effort to achieve values, and it stands against the vice of sloth. Uh, ben Franklin summarized it this way, lose no time, be always employed in something useful. Most basically, we have to exert an effort to think. But thinking is something we do inside our heads. Thinking is how we reach conclusions and decide on acting. Each virtue of objectivism represents a unity of theory with practice. But in the given case, some virtues emphasize the cognitive, i.e. the theory, where others call our attentions to the existential, to practice. Productiveness has the active creation of values, particularly material values, as its focus. Its emphasis is the unity of theory with practice, rather than the unity of practice with theory. This discussion helps us better understand the virtue of industry as in contrast to the basic choice to think and focus your will. You can think theoretically without acting practically. And in fact, this is an abiding problem that many intelligent people have. To not act practically on your knowledge is a case of evasion, the basic vice. It's irrational to not, to not do what you think you should do. And yet, this is a constant temptation because the effects of our current lack of effort are rarely immediately obvious. While the apparent benefit is as plain as day, we get to relax more. There's a theme here about human nature that I should mention, which applies to both thrift and industry. And the theme is that what's immediately perceivable is usually more real to us than things that are distant in time or space that we are only aware of abstractly. So you need a policy of exerting effort to accomplish practical goals. Finally, um, I think there's a, a, at least one more minor virtue of uh, productiveness that's worth talking about, at least productiveness in the way I think about it. And this is creativity. Cre the progress of human, is, human civilization has always depended on innovators, innovators who don't accept that we have to do things the way we always did then. From the discovery of fire, to the steam engine, to genetic therapy, we find over and over that there's a better way of doing things than we had been doing. And the power of human reason with its imagination and abstract thought lets us envision alternatives. That's the reason human beings have been able to be so creative. But how many of us here approach our problems with a policy of creativity? There's so much information available off the shelf, so many pre-made products, so much instant expertise, it's easy to just take it all for granted and do things the way they are normally done. And of course, it's true that in most areas, we aren't experts. So for most of us, just reaching a professional standard of doing something, the kind of standard uh, we, could, we could get if we bought, bought the service, uh, would be uh, doing it better than we currently do it. And just doing things the way they've always been done is mental and spiritual inertia. It's coasting along on the mental impetus of the innovators of the past. Inertia was the, was the policy of ancient Rome where there was little new discovered, and civilization tried to stand still. At the peak, to be sure, at the peak of classical civilization, but standing still, nevertheless. No one even thought progress was possible. Everyone thought the past was at least as good as the present, and they were right. Against inertia, we need to develop the habit of creativity. Creativity is a policy of applying knowledge and imagination to continually seek new means of accomplishing one's goals. So it shares this 
um, goal-oriented, value-oriented orientation of uh, productiveness generally. It's a way of looking at our tasks and a way of going about them. Creativity has the material benefit of improving our methods of production. It can make us more efficient and more able, uh, and able to enjoy more value from the activities we do. That's the value of time-saving innovation, for example. But creativity also provides a profound spiritual benefit. It's the benefit of being really engaged with the world, with your work and your values. To be creative, you have to know your goal very clearly, and you have to understand the causal basis for what you're doing. They say that you only really know something when you teach it to someone else. But creativity is a practice that engages you that deeply, even if you aren't a teacher. You don't just consider your tasks on a surface. You dig into them to see how you can do them better. You ask, what's really going on here? Why are we doing it the way we do? What steps or processes are involved? What's essential to getting this job done? What are other ways of doing these essential tasks? Creativity is therefore deeply empowering. It gives you the sense that you are capable of taking control of and improving your world. Because in fact, the more you approach issues creatively, the more you're really doing exactly that. Creativity is a practice you can cultivate, especially in doing things you know. You can innovate in cooking, revising recipes and developing new ones. You can cultivate it in working on your home, your garden, or your car. You can cultivate it at work, where your goals are clearly defined and the costs involved can be clearly tracked. You can ask yourself, what would make that taste better, run better, sell better, work better, read better, or hold up better over time? What would make that easier to do, quicker to finish, cheaper to put together? Ask yourself, why do we do it this way? And that opens up, why not do it another way? In the end, that means that when you do, you do it your way. Now, thrift, industry, and creativity are applications of the broad, uh, broader virtue of purposefulness. So to summarize, we can see two broad themes at work behind the virtue of, per of productiveness. The first of these broad themes is achievement, because productiveness is a commitment to achievement, to taking the actions, uh, taking action to create one's values and realize one's aspirations. And this is the hallmark of a valuer. It's the character trait of being engaged with the world and of seeing life as, open, as an open-ended opportunity to create things of worth. It's the attitude summed up in the determination to be a person who gets things done. The other theme, I think, is responsibility. It means regarding oneself as the ultimate source of one's efforts, and regarding one's efforts as the basic means by which one's goals are to be realized. It implies the upright declaration that the buck stops here when it comes to one's own needs and, in, and aspirations. This idea of responsibility linked to achievement, this broad virtue of productiveness, might be called entrepreneurial responsibility, too. If you heard Stephen Hicks's talks on entrepreneurship last week, you know what I'm talking about. It's not just taking the blame for things that go wrong or credit for things that go right. It's not just fulfilling your duties on your job or your social roles. It's the attitude of an entrepreneur who takes responsibility for envisioning his long-term goals and taking charge of his destiny. So the virtue of productiveness is the virtue of entrepreneurial living, of making your life a project of value creation. It's a challenge to each of us, really, to make the most of our lives and to realize that it's down to each of us to get the needed jobs done. Thank you. We've got time for a few questions, if any questions have come to mind. Um, if you have a question, if you could go to the mic, because we're recording this, that would be really helpful. Thanks. Oh, by the way, I just want to say Ann Heller is here, who wrote the wonderful biography of Ayn Rand, uh, Ayn Rand and the World She Made. Yay, Ann! I'm jumping ahead to, to a tiny little thing. OK. I helped you make a mistake. You were trying to say inimitable. 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 Yes. And you said in, in, in and I said in, 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 inimical. Inimical yes. means bad. Inimitable yes. means unique. Uh, yes, I apologize for my failure to say inimitable. Uh, Except. <laughs> and thanks for the correction. Um, for me, I think the biggest impact that objectivism has had on me is uh, its vision of life and potential and opportunity. I was wondering if you could talk a little more personally about uh, the role of productive work in your life and what it means to you. Um, 
for, for me, um, the idea of productiveness as a virtue in objectivism really helped uh, both alter the way I view the world and the way I view my own life. So that I stopped looking out at the world, in terms of just seeing the world, that I, uh, I suppose because I work in social analysis and cultural analysis, this is actually relevant to my actual job. Uh, and in fact, I was an economist at the time that I really started learning about objectivism. Uh, in any case, I started looking out at the world and just seeing a wonder of value creation happening everywhere. If every moment of ka-ching at the cash register is really the moment of uh, the most objective social approval you'll ever see, then you're watching a miracle of value creation, of life improvement, of, of, of rational approval happening all around you, in every store you see, in every commercial interaction you observe, in every voluntary, equitable interaction you see. And that's like, it's like, uh, it's practically the most religious thing about objectivism for me. I'd, only the idea of life as an end in itself had an equally kind of, ba bum here's the, the rich, symbolic uh, meaning of life. So I, this, this is a very important aspect of objectivism for me. Also, like for, I think for, for many of us, for me, it turned my work, my attitude toward my work into saying, what can I do to be useful? And how should I serve society? And how can I be respectable? And then, you know, how can I laze off as much as possible? And gee, isn't it great to be a grad student? Because, you know, I'm getting paid and I can live on a minimum and I just get to fart around. And there's nothing wrong, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a grad student. There's nothing wrong with living on the minimum to do what you really want to do. That's not it. But the objective, but objectivism asked, made me ask myself, what am I doing to produce, to create, to make the world that I want to live in, to make things that I really want? And that's changed the way I the way I, I work and what I do. And it was an immense thrill for me to actually get a professional job working in objectivism because I, I love the theory and uh, the academic side of it, but I love the idea too of working to change the culture, which is certainly an aspect of working to do something that, that, I, that I, certainly that I cared very much about. As someone who knew, I, I, I can't go on. I, I'm too fascinated with my, well, I'm not too fascinated with myself, but I'm very fascinated with myself and I could go on and on. But right. thanks Thank for the question. Thank you so much. Sure. I have actually a related question. Um, I want to ask you how two categories of people fit in with that scheme of producing and trading versus looting versus mooching. Uh, and the two categories are, one, persons who work for uh, nonprofit organizations of various kinds uh, where a lot of the value that you're producing is not going in any direct form uh, right into the hands of the person who's doing the paying. Um, you know, if there's a cultural shift brought about, for example, by the Atlas Society, uh, the major donors are not getting that to the exclusion of everybody else. And likewise, if, if you know, the donations may not produce uh, that result. Um, and se and second, uh, people who work in the government of a reasonably free society uh, who are deriving their income from taxation, but providing exclusively or primarily the proper services of government that enable trade. Okay, um, uh, let me take those in reverse order, if I may. Um, government has to be financed, and how it can be is a matter to consider when we're much closer to a free society. If the tax money is being paid for uh, genuine government services that are being rendered in, with reasonable efficiency, then those people are, should, be, should regard themselves as traitors, in, in effect people that are giving value for value. Because they're being supported through a taxation system, they should give double thought for how well they're serving their customers, the citizens. But um, I, you know, the mere fact of having their jobs doesn't confirm that they have it. And as to nonprofit organizations, there should be none. The only reason nonprofit organizations exist at all is a wrinkle in the tax code uh, that's been motivated by altruism, really. Uh, so, in an ideal 
political system, you know, that wrinkle wouldn't exist. And then you wouldn't organize. If you organized a cooperative, you'd organize it for some other reasons. But, the, but you mean like donor-supported organizations that do work for their donors that it doesn't rev create an immediate concrete product for them. So like the work we do at the Atlas Society is a lot of the people I talk to who are donors say, well, what I really like is the kind of influence you're having on other people, the influence you're having on the culture. Well, this is real work. It's trade in the first place because as an organization and any uh, donor support organization lives and dies by the approval of the people who support it. And we live and die based on our donors' support for us. We have a package to sell to them of the work that we do. Um, and it's real work that's valuable to them because we live in a society. The cultural trends that exist, the political trends that exist, uh, all really matter for what's possible to us in society and what everyone can do. And getting real work done to make the best cultural environment is something every one of us needs. So, uh, and it's unfortunately a public good in the sense that the, 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 the benefits are non-rival. But that doesn't mean it's not a real benefit. It's a real benefit, all right. And for those of you who are supporting our work, we appreciate it. And if we can do anything better to earn your trust and uh, do more to create the values you're paying us to produce, let us know. And Anne, one last question. Uh, hi, Will. I thought I heard you suggest provocatively that uh, hunters and gatherers are the equivalent in an industrial society of uh, looters and moochers. I love uh, that idea. <laughs> uh, no, although in a way, uh, that's a good metaphor. Uh, the, the predators, uh, looters and moochers in an industrial society are acting kind of like hunters and gatherers. They're treating the human beings as the trees whose fruit must be plucked. And that's, uh, that's, certainly, that's certainly true. Um, and I'm afraid that's the last question I've got Could time I to take. Can I ask one more? Uh, yes, OK. <laughs> I think this is worth it might be worth putting on the record because it's a huge issue today. What about uh, entrepreneurs who make an excellent living from entirely voluntary customers over the internet by, say, a site called uh, BDSM Torture or, um, you know, real exciting films of rapes right here, authentic rapes? What about things that we would consider very irrational, but it's an entirely voluntary trade and big money, and they hear the ka-ching all the time. Or what about um, a liquor store owner who's dealing liquor and knows darn well that uh, a certain number of their customers are alcoholics who are destroying their lives uh, because you think it's categorically. You say it's different because it's cate one case is categorically immoral and the other is? Yes. OK. Um, I would just think that's a difference of degree. Categorically but immoral. Oh, there, there's, yes. Sure. What about um, uh, really awful religious groups that really do, uh, they, they don't, don't admix good values with bad ones, but give the real vitriol, right? The, the, real, the real venom. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's unwise as an egoist policy to pursue the creation of values, uh, the production of values for other people that are destructive of those people. Um, even if those people will voluntarily purchase them, even if they will. Um, of course, in these cases, assuming that no crime was committed, you mentioned filmed rapes or something, uh, assuming they're, they're, they're just, they're just, but they're, well, they're selling the crime, well, the, cr the crime, let's just set the crime aspect aside. Um, a, and then insofar as um, in these cases the buyers are being destroyed, uh, you know, we have to go to the buyers, too, and ask them why they're supporting this kind of industry and why they're looking for these kind of values. Uh, so I don't, think, um, I don't think in an objectivist society, we're not libertarians. We're not obliged to say, because you're trading, we approve of everything you do. You can do lots of immoral things trading. In The Fountainhead, the novel The Fountainhead, entirely concerns, uh, you know, in everything essential, concerns activities done in trade. And yet it catalogs the most greatest calumnies and immoralities and, and, and poor thinking and bad choices and evil actions. So, so is by no means the sign of the most objective moral approval. It's only sometimes you really have to decide when ka-ching means good and when ka-ching means 
Gotcha. Yeah, when I said that uh, every sale was like a sign of the most objective moral approval, I mean it's the most, it's the most objective uh, form of social approval you'll see. It's not that every time someone engages in trade there is a correct mor objective moral assessment, but most people are pursuing their own lives and happiness. And so for mo most people are trying to do the best in their lives in a confused way. And so in most cases, in, in no other form of social approval will you see so much of the genuine choice to try and look for a better life always invested. So it's the most objective, but it's not always objective by nature.